hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can. Hi, ah, great. Hey, <laughs> great stuff. Hi, How's it going? nice to see you. Oh <laughs> yeah, you too. It's, you know, like, it's not live or anything like that, which is cool. So, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> there's not like I, thousands of people watching you right now. That's, <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I did the ABC conversation in Australia. It was live. Wow. Was no ways. Live interview, yeah. I didn't know that. How did that go? Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, people said it was fine, but I found it so nerve-wracking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the main one, the podcast, that, that podcast that yeah. they... No ways. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You did really well then, actually. I'm really oh, thank impressed. thank you. No, seriously, that's not easy. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so and I'm I glad find... this is not live. That's good. Yeah, cool. we're, we're big B fans, so like, yeah. <laughs> I just totally love them, which is cool. Uh, yeah, I was, I was actually away. I was in Portugal the last few days, and um, I was there with a friend of mine. He has his own hives as well, and he, you know, oh, wow. it's just fascinating talking to to him, yeah. you know, and, and yeah, it's just like it's amazing what these little creatures can do. Yeah. All right, so we're here with Helen Dukes all the way in the Y Valley, and uh, we're really excited to chat to someone that really knows her bees. And uh, Gareth and I have had a big fascination with these little creatures for some time now, and there's something quite ethereal about them, but also maybe a little bit scary for some people. So, Helen, how does someone leave their job, write a book, and find love, all thanks to these? <laughs> Little insects take us take us back yeah. to where the journey began. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah, I guess I guess I first um, came across bees um, when I was living in London. Um, a friend of mine introduced me to a guy called Luke Dixon, um, who at the point that I met him had hives all across the city, in council estates, on rooftops in wildlife gardens and parks. Um, and I asked to be taken along with him one day when he went to um, uh, visit his house. And um, I think on the way there, I had this thought that maybe it was gonna be a bit more scary than I'd realized. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was sort of really excited about it um, up until the point when we got there and I suddenly realized, oh, we're going to have to put these huge suits on. And actually, when you lift the lid, there are tens of thousands of bees inside a hive. And they're all, as, as you open it up, you're disturbing their home. So they rise up and there are guard bees flying out. And um, I found it a really peculiar experience to have in the middle of a city. Um, and in other ways, very normal going to work, getting home type life. Um, and that, yeah, there was something about it that I found really fascinating. And for the next few years, I, I would sort of go along with him to visit the hive. Um, and I just sort of had this growing sense of a um, very strange wild creature living within and through our urban lives. It's quite, a, quite an amazing thing to experience um, when you start getting a sense of it. Um, yeah, and that was that was the sort of lead in to what happened when I moved to Oxford, which was um, which is what the book covers. Um, so when I moved to Oxford, I had a house with a garden for the first time, and was able to get my own house, which was a very different experience. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, what were you doing at the time in London? Were you working in an office, or what were? What yeah. Were you yeah exactly yeah i was i was working um for an arts organization so it was a very very officey fluorescent light bulbs um computer screen type job yeah very different um space to to being with a hose yeah and, and how did you like say that your newfound relationship with bees and working in office how did that sort of change your mind about the office space or did it at all you know because obviously you moved away from it but I'm sure it had some sort of impact yeah, yeah well when I was in London I guess it was a um it was it was maybe a kind of escape route like a little duck that I could um uh 
jump through and go and experience something quite different. Um, when I moved to Oxford and I had a hive of my own, that that was different because it was um, I was having to really take responsibility for a colony and be with it through the different seasons. Working with Luke in London, I was always switching from one hive to another, and I never really had any proper responsibility. But when you're actually you become a beekeeper yourself, and you're stepping into this relationship with a very wild creature, and you know that you're now responsible for its well-being for the next however many months and um, that's a very different experience and I think that um, that was maybe the point where I developed a really different kind of focus um, and became deeply fascinated in this very strange creature mm -hmm. and began spending all of my time outside the office reading um, many different kinds of bee books about beekeeping history and bee physiology and anatomy and um, yeah, I got a bit obsessed. In. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. We need and, people like you. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that an, a, a sort of a strange environment to be in would be a city looking at beehives. So um, there's some hives in an unexpected places in and around London. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about those and? and how they, how they work and maybe it's possible to have a hive anywhere in a city. Yeah, I mean, I've met some beekeepers with hives in very strange places. There's a guy that I know from the Ukraine who kept a hive high up on one of those um, like concrete blocks of flats in the Ukraine, um, just on his apartment balcony. Um, Luke, my friend in London, has hives on the top of, yeah, on the top of sort of 12, 14 storey buildings. There was one that he had on the top of the London College of Fashion, which is <laughs> right over Oxford Street. So we used to look down and see all of these people like ants moving along the road <laughs> as, we were, as we were up beekeeping. Um, so yeah, all kinds of places. Yeah. It's quite nice when you sort of realise how many different habitats there are that bees can live in yeah yeah it's so cool like I, I was, it's so weird like i live in greenwich and uh we have a beautiful park here and there's like one sort of section of the park like right in the corner which I, i'd never been to even though i've lived here for eight years and i went there probably about about two months ago and we were walking through and at the like in the one sort of corner of this uh, of this corner they there was bees and like hives and stuff. And I was like, no way is there's beehives here in Greenwich. And, and then there was also like a, I think it was like a Kickstarter campaign, um, if, uh, probably a year or so ago that I saw uh, where guys were setting up hives in London because apparently there are so many bees here and stuff. And I was just amazed by the fact that, you know, they, they do it like in the city and yeah, it's just, uh, it's just really, really fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So I was just going to say, it's interesting. Um, I, people say that now honeybees are healthier in suburban areas than they are in rural areas because <clears throat> cities offer greater diversity of forage and flowers. Whereas in, our, in the UK, in our rural areas, um, often there's very, very little forage for bees now. We have crops that flower over a very short period of time, but then there's very little through the rest of the year. So, yeah, it's interesting to, it's yeah. sort of counterintuitive. In yeah, yeah, definitely. And and so, so your like introduction to it, I think was it some of your mates bought you like a, a starter kit or something like that. How, yeah. how did that come about? And like, how, what is a starter kit? <laughs> Sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah, so um, I think when I moved to Oxford, I must have been going on about it. And um, that the first Christmas I was there, um, I was gifted a, a, um, a colony of bees in waiting. Um, wow. So I, I, in the spring, went to pick up a nuke, which is, which is like a starter colony, a small colony that you then transfer into a full hive. And if all goes well, then they grow and expand and, and um, accept your hive as home. Yeah, it was, there was a bit of a wobbly period where I wasn't sure if they would. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> In what way, like when you had actually taken that nuke and, and started it and you were a little bit worried that they were going to survive, is that what you mean? 
Yeah, there was a really, there was a really uncertain few weeks where they didn't seem to be exp expanding. They, they, there's a very short period where bees have to, you have to have new comb in order for the, um, yeah, there was a, there was a pretty um, uncertain period for I think a couple of weeks where um, I'd taken out the old frames and I was waiting for the bees to build new comb. They have to build new comb in order for the queen to lay eggs and then the colony, you know that the colony can sustain itself. Um, and I didn't think that the, they were building enough comb or fast enough. And um, so, yeah, I was very, uh, very nervous for a few weeks. And then it all seemed to get going and it found its own rhythm and stuff and they were fine. But um, yeah, it's really surprising how nerve wracking it is when you have these bees yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you'd had a, a, a Kenyan top bar hive, apparently. That, that, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and, and maybe what the difference is with that kind of a hive? Yeah, so it's quite different. I guess the, um, the hive that most people have in their head is um, the one that looks a bit like a house. It's like a wooden box with a triangular roof on top. But mine was a top bar hive, which is a bit like um, a boat on legs <laughs> or a manger, kind of a manger shape. Um, so traditionally, they were, they were literally logs on, on their sides that had been um, uh, hollowed out um, and filled with uh, bars along the top. Um, so you, you, you rest bars right along the top. And the idea is that the bees... Um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm making hand actions and I realise you can't <laughs> The idea is that the bees um, build comb down from these top bars rather than building inside the rectangular frames that we have inside modern hives. They're, they're following their own instincts about the shape and the, the form of, of comb. Um, so it's supposed to be a more natural approach. And I found it really amazing to lift up a bar that a week ago had had been a piece of wood and now was um, fitted with, with heavy comb. It's amazing how heavy it gets. Wow. Gee, that's so interesting. And how many bees are there in a nuke? Oh, in a nuke? I'm not sure. A few thousand. Yeah. Um, at the height of summer, I think my colony grew. My friend Luke came to look and he said he thought it was about 70,000. Wow. So they'll change throughout the year. They'll expand through the summer and then shrink again in the winter. Um, but yeah, yeah thousands. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> hey. And and when you sort of started doing this, uh, the beekeeping, did your how did your friends react? What was their sort of response to the whole uh, change? In yeah. oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, people have quite different reactions to it. Some people definitely thought I was mad. <laughs> um, I guess it's quite uh yeah I guess it's quite a peculiar thing to do because of the responsibility I guess the responsibility that some people think goes along with it. I definitely was I'd had a very um I guess quite transitive temporary kind of existence up until then I've been moving around a lot and I went I my life was my own I was quite free in where I was and what I did and um maybe people were quite surprised that I was doing something that would sort of in theory tie me down but um yeah that was probably what I was nervous about a bit as well yeah. okay and you would take you would take like some of your mates and and sort of show them your work and and, and were you sort of like proud of the fact that they were you know this new kid taken and you and I like you know a kid with a new you know what I mean like really excited to show people yeah. or did were you kind of private about it oh yeah probably a bit of a mixture it was a really I think I probably began wanting it to be quite a private thing um I was I was in this really stressful job at the time and I think I really needed an escape and I sort of had the idea that a hive at the end of my garden would be a place that was just mine and I wouldn't be answerable to any people, I wouldn't have to talk to anyone. And, and actually what I found that was that um, it was a place where um, 
people were really important and I really needed the input from uh, other beekeepers I'd met and friends that came and actually it's an amazing thing to see people's reactions when you take them to the hive and they're experiencing it for the first time. Um, so yeah, it ended up being a lot more social than I thought it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. And uh, Helen, you've also written a, a book. Um, is I think it's a honeybee heart has five openings. And mm-hmm. how did that all come about? And you know, what was the sort of like trajectory towards going there? Yeah. Um, I well, around the time that I started beekeeping in Oxford, I met a beekeeper who said keep an observation diary he said it's so important right make a note each time you open the hive or each time you notice anything different make a note of what's happening and mm. um, so i started doing that and really quickly this notebook um became a place where i was putting other observations and other things mm. that i'd learned or that i was thinking about um and in a really um i guess quite a soft and unexpected way the bees started connecting up different things that I've been thinking about a lot in my life about responsibility and care and um, home and what home is and what it is to um, uh, be in a relationship with a wild creature or a relationship with another creature and um, so I I guess that notebook became a kind of thinking place Um, and writing has always been my way to process and understand and um, and so at a certain point I just started writing from it Um, yeah and and then it got longer and longer and longer (laughs) and people were saying I think you're writing a book and I was saying I'm not writing a book (laughs) (laughs) and eventually (laughs) It's really beautiful, actually, the the care that you took and and how it sort of morphed into this this other this other creature, so to speak, the the writings. And I think it's a good lesson to to document things and to it helps mm-hmm. you just to really understand what's happening during that process. Uh, even if you don't end up writing the book, I think it's a really great lesson. And so, so mm-hmm. when did it become okay? I am writing a book, and and did you sort of make a a real decision I'm going to actually do this now and and how did that sort of happen yeah I think um yeah that's a really good question I think I I think it was quite important not to be too conscious that I was doing it so I think in a way I um because the questions that I had and the things that I was wanting to ask with this book felt so private in a way or so um, unknown and uncertain that in a way I had to keep it in a, in a not too self-conscious place. I think if I'd said I was writing a book, it would have become too, uh, it would have killed it. <laughs> so I think maybe I just had to tell myself I wasn't um, in order to let those things come out in their own way yeah um there was a point when um i went um with my i was massively lucky that i had an offer to go and stay in italy for a few months and through a friend and i went with my boyfriend and that was where i really sat down and i wrote a whole manuscript and then was ready to to send it out to people Um, (laughs) but i think probably even then when i'd done that which was a really big risk i think i um I think I still wasn't able to say that I wanted to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> and and did, did it, was it like a nice sense of achievement when you had actually written out that whole manuscript? Yeah. Yeah. It went through lots of different phases. There were lots more edits after that. Um, I think the moment I really, it became a book was when I had the first proof through last year, the first sort of proof copy. And I saw it as a thing for the first time and, I think that was the moment when it exited my mind and became a thing that was separate from me. That, that was an amazing moment. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. And, and you spoke about like the bees, I guess, making you sort of change your mind on a few things and 
get you thinking differently, I guess, like you said, like about homes and relationships and stuff like that. I think it, it by the sounds of your story, you met, uh, you met your boyfriend um, and it kind of bees had some sort of influence in like opening up your heart. Is, uh, is that sort of true? Is that, is that how things, is that how yeah, they helped you? I think, um, I think there's something really um, particular and often forgotten in today's busy, movable, shifting world. Um, there's something really special about um, making time to really pay attention to another creature and um, really slow down and, um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, be in the company of something that is totally different from yourself, like a creature that whose logics and um, ways of doing things and living are so um so alien in some ways um and i think that really shifted my way of looking at the world and inhabiting the world um it's it opened my opened me up in a way in a way that i think i'd become i was working this quite stressful job and my body and my senses and everything about me had had sort of narrowed very thinly um, and when you're um when you're um faced with a creature whose sensory experience and um sense of the world is so expansive it's difficult not to be affected by that i think i'm not sure that's a very good answer to the question <laughs> no, no, no. That makes a lot of sense. And also, I guess, like you said earlier, you had moved a lot and now you had this thing that was this anchor for you and you, so maybe you had a glimpse of, of what stability and, and home and uh, that kind of thing could, could look like. And I would imagine that might've played a role too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And, and it's, yeah, I think that's really true. And and it's so interesting to think about stability in the context of honeybees because they they create this amazingly um, fine tuned stability that they're they're so wild and everything's changing for them all the time. All of these thousands of creatures all working together um, that their stability can only ever be a very temp temporary or very um, uh, um, delicate thing, I think. So, so I, in a way, I think they taught me that um, home and stability is a maybe a feeling and a state that we can um, generate for ourselves or create for ourselves. And I think it's to do with attention, it's to do with um, care and um, uh, looking after each other, looking after the things around us. Wow. And, and and what do you think like what do you think is like the biggest lesson that you learned from bees that you probably implemented in your life? Um, oh, that's a really big question. I think I'm still learning all the time, probably. It's so funny. I I think one of the things I really like about beekeeping is that I um I I am always a learner with them. Um and that is quite humbling in a way um, and makes me much more attuned to all my relationships, I think. Um, yeah, that's not a very good answer to <laughs> it. It was a tricky question. <laughs> it is a, that's a big question, but it's, I guess you being, you know, being sensitive when you, when you're forced to be sensitive to one uh, creature you you can be more sensitive to others too and um yeah. it makes a lot of sense uh, that that it just opens up your your horizons by you know by focusing on one thing you can uh, like you said the stability finding stability within a frenetic environment 
is a is a really powerful thing it, it sort of almost reminds me of like meditation or something like that you know yeah. and, uh, there is something a- really there's there's a similarity i think for me certainly about beekeeping and meditation yeah i was never very good at meditation i tried it lots of times but sitting down in a room and closing my eyes i would just <laughs> go to sleep or think about other things but somehow looking at bees so much is going on all of the time and you're watching this amazing poise um yeah it's my meditation i think yeah for sure i, I always think like meditation is like almost just a distraction from actually all this other noise that's going on and and when you are there deep in your hive like <laughs> there's not much else you must be thinking of i can imagine yeah 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 and it's quite bodily as well and you have to be so aware of your movement because the bees, if you move slightly too, you, if you jerk a little bit or you um, make a noise that's unexpected, then the whole colony will sort of move and, and respond to it and be unsettled by it. Um, so you have to be really aware of needing to be slow and careful. And gentle. Um, I'm not always very good at that. So it's, it's really... Um, a good lesson for me. Do you almost like need to move with the bees and some, is there some sort of art to it? Um, there's definitely a skill to it. I think I really notice um, sometimes you meet a beekeeper who is just has it in their bones or their blood somehow. And it's, it's amazing to see some people are so, um, yes. So, so in their body as they do it um, I, I'm not I don't think I think I'm still a bit too clumsy but, um, yeah. but the, the I, I'd heard a, a story or read a story that your uh, mate Luke had uh, when you your one of your first encounters with bees had said that they can smell fear and that you know, and there you are walking up to your first hive thinking, you know, be calm, don't, don't let them know that I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah, and as soon as someone says they can smell your fear, what do you yeah. do? You get scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, sure. I actually remember when I was really, really young, like I was, I don't know, maybe 12 years old. My sister was a few years younger. And we were, we had just got in the car. Mom had just picked us up from school and this bee was flying around and actually landed like on my sister's nose or her forehead or something like that. And then literally blood just started pouring from her nose. She was like so scared. You know what I mean? What? Yeah, I know. Seriously, literally like just as blood started pouring, I was like, whoa. And, um, but the bee didn't actually sting her or anything. It was obviously a friendly one and just kind of, (laughs) That fear, yeah. it smelt, but it just let yeah. it. <laughs> well, yeah. that's next level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, Helen, uh, you, you, um, you know, I don't know if this is a hobby for you. Actually, I feel like this is a lot more of a visceral, uh, deeper thing. But, you know, what is a what would you say is a the role of a hobby in in our busy lives? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, hobbies can be lots of things. Um, I think something that really surprised me about beekeeping was um, that certainly in Oxford, doing a job that was really um, high pressure and that was taking up a lot of time, um, I really doubted that I was going to manage to make any space any extra space to to um look after a hive um and what was really fascinating was how um as i as the season the beekeeping season started and things started rolling i actually found that the space kind of created itself and that my own interest and my own desire to um, learn about the bees and to go and sit with the hive um, I found I found the space where I didn't think there was any um, and I and I think um, that feels really important that maybe hobbies are a needed space in in the otherwise frenetic lives that we've been talking about um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and and 
why would you sort of recommend that someone takes up beekeeping specifically as mm. a hobby? Yeah, well, would I recommend? I'm not sure. I mean, bees don't need us. They have been quite fine for thousands of years and they are world creatures. They've never domesticated, so they, they don't need beekeepers. Um, what they do need are more foraging habitats. So if people want to help bees, then plant flowers and, and um, yeah. campaign and, and make more bee-friendly habitats. But um, I guess if you're interested in beekeeping, then I do think it's a really, um, really unique way of um, gaining access to um, a wildness or a wild nature that is difficult to come by in a city um, and I think that is quite special um, today and certainly has changed my way of looking at and experiencing my environment yeah and you get honey at the end of the day which is kind of cool <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah the honey thing too <laughs> yeah. so, so if I wanted to sorry Craig so if I wanted to okay. do it, um in London, how, how would I go about doing it myself? Because I, I actually really would love to, you know, have a hive and learn a lot more about bees. Is there any yeah, specific oh. way to do um, it? I, I know there are, um, there are lots of courses now. Um, and, and I think there are, there are examples I've heard of people kind of getting together and keep and keeping a hive together on say an, a community allotment or a community gardens. And I think that sounds like a really good idea. Um, I think for me having a, um, a mentor or having a group that I could go and talk to was crucial. Um, because there were so many times when I just didn't know what was going on in the hive. <laughs> And, and it was really important to be able to call someone up or write to someone or go along to a group and say, I don't understand this, and what, what might be happening. Um, so yeah, I think um, join, join a group or, or a course or link up with other people, I think is a really good way to do it. And, and you mentioned, um, uh, what, what is the word you used? For foraging space or, or um, uh, areas yeah. where what what kind of what does that mean in terms in context of a of our little urban garden uh yeah so i think there are loads of ways that you can um make your garden uh like a place that's good for honeybees but also all wild pollinators there are in the uk we have 250 bee species and worldwide there are 20,000 i think so and many many more pollinating insects that all need forage and, and um, so I guess the important thing is to make sure that there are there's going to be pollen and nectar throughout the year um, bees will start flying in late winter early spring so things in the UK things like crocuses are really good early on um, and then they need forage right up until early autumn so ivy is is good at the end of the year um, so a range of different flowers is good. Planting in blocks is good as well because that's, they can be more efficient then. There's a, um, they expend so much energy going from one flower to the next that if one flower species is clumped, then it, there's not so much distance to fly between each flower. <laughs> um, there's a good as well. If you have a small space, then um, planting different flowers at different heights means that you can fit more in. Um, but there's loads, I mean, it's so good. There are so many websites now that have advice about um, what species to plant. And obviously, less less or no pesticides is really important. Mm. Of course. Yeah, that's big. And yeah. um, of course, bees produce this amazing stuff called honey. <laughs> How much uh, honey does a bee actually produce? And can you maybe just tell us a bit about what honey is? Yeah, yeah. Um, so one bee, I think, produces a teaspoon of honey in her whole lifetime. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is amazing when you think about it, yeah. 
Um, and so, so honey is um, made from nectar, which bees collect from inside plants. Um, and, and when they um, when they're out foraging, they suck nectar up with their proboscis, which is like a curling tongue, um, and they keep it in a, temp a sort of temporary stomach and fly back to the hive. And when they get into the hive, they regurgitate it. They um, puke it up <laughs> from their tongue, um, and and then. Um, pass it on to another bee inside the hive. These are all worker bees, so they're all the, the female bees in the colony. Um, and the next bee will then extract a bit of moisture from it and suck it up again, and then regurgitate it again and pass it on to the next bee. And this will go on all the way through the hive. Um, I read an experiment that had been done where someone had um, treated a sample of nectar with a radioactive tracer so that they could watch how far it went through the colony. And I think at the end of the day, it had gone almost all the way through the colony. So, so um, the, the final product has traveled through all of these bees at the point that it finally, it's so condensed that it's become honey. And at that point, it's stored in, um, in honeycomb cells, capped with wax, and then it, it will, um, it will last a long time like that. It's their winter food supply, so so for them they're storing it and they'll they'll eat it in the winter. Wow, that's you crazy. mentioned <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. One teaspoon, I can't believe that. So yeah. so the you mentioned the one type of bee, and there's obviously a, a hive has got a certain structure to it, as you mentioned, but also the sort of amorphousness about it, which is it's quite an interesting combination, but. What is the hierarchy in within the hive, and and what are the different bees? Uh, what are their roles? Yeah, so there are three different types of bee in the hive. There's the queen; she's the only fertile bee in the colony. So she'll mate once in her. Well, she may mate a few times, but she'll mate over one short period, um, and and then she will lay eggs through the rest of her life. Um, there are drones, which are male bees. They don't really do anything except um, mate, and then they're killed at the end of the um, at the end of the season. So, in the approach to winter, um, and then there are worker bees who do everything. <laughs> they raise young, they feed babies, they um, clean the hive. They um, they're under, there are undertaker worker bees who pull out the dead bodies. They go out and they forage and they make honey. So they really, they're doing everything. And they're, I mean, you use the word hierarchy, but actually it's a really, it's a lot more democratic system than it sounds. We use the word queen, but she's not really, um, she's not really in charge. The, the, a lot of the control is with the workers. And the, and the workers though, isn't there like a, a subcategory of work as in like they, they each have a specific role. Like you said, some are responsible just for foraging, some are responsible just for cleaning, you know, is yeah. that, is that the case? Yeah, that's true. Um, but, but they each go through, they each have every role through their life. So uh -huh. they begin life as a nurse bee, I think. And then as their body matures, different capacities, um, develop so at a certain point their wax glands will start producing wax and then they'll become comb builders and then at a later point they'll leave the hive and then become foragers so each every single bee actually does performs every role in the hive but just at different points in their life it's I mean it's amazing I just I'm constantly um amazed by, by and and, and, and it's it is amazing. And also, isn't this just in the space of like eight weeks or how, how long is their yeah. life? Yeah, it, it depends on the time of year. So, so um, in winter, worker bees um, might live for a month or so, but at the height of summer, only a few weeks because they're working yeah. so hard that they'll, they'll die of exhaustion. Yeah. Jeez. It's incredible. It's really incredible. <laughs> and then, and then, like bees, obviously, like waggle their sort of little tails and stuff. Is there a particular reason for that? Is it some sort of messaging between them? What is the yeah? Yeah. So there's the waggle dance, um, which which is, I guess, maybe the most famous form of honeybee communication, <laughs> um, which is um, yeah, really extraordinary. 
these views, this particular um, series of move movements to communicate the exact location of a particular pollen source. So, so this would be a, forag a foraging worker bee that had found, say, a really great lavender bush, would go back to the hive and perform this particular, it's almost like a figure of eight. She waggles her bum very quickly and then does a figure of eight. And it, it communicates um, the position of the um, lavender bush um, in relation to the sun and the um, distance that other bees should travel. <laughs> and through, through um, sensing this dance, it takes place in pitch black, pitch darkness, because Jeez. it's inside the hive and so there's no light. Mm. But other bees will feel the dance and they will, um, she'll pass uh, like samples of the pollen and nectar to them so that they'll know what they're looking for. So experiencing this dance, they'll be able to go and, and find the, the lavender bush. It's, yeah, wow. really amazing. That is in, so, that's so, incredible. <laughs> and yeah, like so, so, you say, it's all in the dark. Sorry, sorry Craig. It's oh, all in the dark. It's amazing. That's, the, that's yeah. the real fascinating part as well, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. yeah. So, so are you saying that they, just following on with Gareth saying that, so in the dark, they, they sort of feeling, there's a sort of a, <laughs> a vibe that they get, or is it the actually body against body? Is it the energy that they do the dance at? What is the, like, yeah. do they have a mean, for the code? Like, yeah, I think there are aspects of it that are still not quite understood. Um, but as far as we know, um, the bee will um, drum her abdomen against the comb and that creates a particular series of vibrations that will draw other foragers towards her. It, it's a kind of signal to other bees across the comb that, oh, I've got something to tell you. And they'll gravitate towards her. And then, yeah, I think... I think um, uh, the theory is that um, other bees use that. It's so funny when you're describing, like, <laughs> using my fingers to sort of um, describe this, yeah, it's a different point. But, but, um, yeah, they use their antennae, which are, which are covered in um, sense receptors, um, to feel, yeah, in the dark, touch is used a lot, so to, to, to feel the movements of the bee. Um, the dancing bees, yeah. And they can tell how far away um, that the plant is and, and yes. sort of how good the nectar is and stuff like that, apparently? Yeah. So, um, so combs in the hive are, are exactly vertical, um, which means that they can, sense they can sense gravity. And so the um, angle of the dancing bee in relation to um, down, in, re in, in relation to uh, gravity's pull will communicate to them the um, direction of the pollen source in relation to the sun. And then the length of the dance will communicate the distance that they should travel. So it's this amazing sort of symbolic language that they've developed. Yes. They, they lack these amazing mathematicians, um, I guess, in some sort of way, yeah. aren't they? Like uh, just with everything they do. So yeah. just like, like just sort of a bit left field, but w were you ever interested, say, like in maths as a kid or were you more interested in sort of creative writing and stuff? And has it got you maybe more interested in the mathematical side of things? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think it's, um, no, I was no good at maths or science <laughs> at school. But um, yeah, I think somehow when you're so fascinated by something and it's right in front of you, I think maybe I wasn't so good at sort of abstract thought, but, but when this creature's right in front of you and you can see this complex system of communication happening, then it's difficult not to become really fascinated by... Um, by what's actually taking place. And their bodies are so strange that I became really fascinated in, um, yeah, their sensory communication and their sensory experience of the world, which is so different to us in lots of ways. Yeah, there's so many, there, there's a whole electromagnetic spectrum that human beings are just not privy to. And animals like bees have a totally different experience of the world. And there's so much going on around us that we don't even 
know about, but for example, bees is just normal for them. So it's a little window into that world, isn't it? And uh, yeah. you spoke about a sort of a complex system and I guess bees can be viewed as individuals, but also as this sort of a, a super organism and which mm. is quite a fascinating. And uh, is there something to be said for the individual bee or are they doing it all for the greater good? Yeah. Yeah, I think this this was one of the things that I just kept finding um, that year in Oxford as I was as I was learning and reading a lot about bees um, was that they so often um, are in excess of the categories that we try and fit them into. So, are they wild or domestic? Are they individual or are they collective? Is honey an animal product or is it plant based? There are so mm. many ways I think that we try and apply these sort of binary categories through them but actually they're in excess of them and they they're far more slippery and fluid than um than maybe we allow for um and it's interesting because it's so as a beekeeper it's impossible to follow a single bee and and um and i, I guess my experience standing in front of the hive was of a, the super organism more than anything of this real um, collective, highly, highly sensitive and highly attuned system. I mean, system sounds a bit um, mechanical or something, and it it didn't feel like that. Um, but it it was a whole. It it was like a whole super organism. Um, but people have done experiments that have shown that individual bees um, vary in their preferences and mm -hmm. and. So far, more individuation than and than I guess a lot of us would imagine. So I think someone did an experiment where they fitted every bee in a colony with a radio tip and then followed them throughout their lives and found that different bees exhibited different characteristics. Like some were cold preferring, some were warmth seeking, some were much more hard working, and others were more lazy. So there's there's this amazing kind of like they are definitely individual beings, even even in this sort of amazing kind of collective entity. Yeah. Hmm. It's amazing. And and talking about super organisms, uh, I was wondering like can we like include sort of ants in that? And is there any relationship to how ants work and how bees work? Yeah, I'm not the right person to ask. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. But yeah. yeah, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I, it was interesting. I, I read something a while ago that the weight, the total weight of all the ants in the world is something like 10 times the weight of all the humans in the world because there yeah. are literally so many ants. I mean, I, I could be completely <laughs> wrong, but it, but when you see like these guys that they dig up their sort of ant holes and the, all their tunnels and stuff, how massive they are, it's almost mm. quite believable that that's, uh, wow. yeah. That that's possible <laughs> and it's funny isn't it how i guess we can we can go along in our um in our busy lives and be quite oblivious to this huge diverse creature life that exists mm. all around us all the time yeah exactly yeah. exactly i was wondering if you could, I, sorry no, no just before we move on sorry I, I was just thinking there could be some sort of a um um, uh, when you were talking about it now, like a microcosm of the of the world is like a maybe a little beehive, you know, like everyone's got their little roles going about their their thing, but we're all individuals, and I guess you can see it in a real positive sense, um, but you can also see it in a negative way that we're just kind of this machine that we're part of, you know, and it's it's just kind of a weird uh, thing to think about if you extrapolate uh, if you anthropomorphize them a little bit, you know. Yeah. I guess people people have been um, using the hive as a model for human society for thousands of years and drawing all kinds of conclusions about human society from it. Um, and it's taken so many different um, forms, the symbolism that we have about the hive, that I think maybe it says more about us and the things that we project yeah. onto the hive than it does about the bees, really. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to think about and interesting to think about why bees are, what's, what's capturing people's imagination about bees at the moment, because I think in some ways they're a kind of zeitgeist, like they're really representing something for us at the moment. Uh, 
people get very passionate about about bees and about honeybees and it's interesting to think about what yeah, what the colony or what bees are meaning to us now mm. And can you just maybe explain a little bit more about uh, how the queen is selected or the next one is selected and, and then also, you know, maybe just about how they, um, or, sorry, the other thing was you know, about, you mentioned that they, uh, that they kill the males at some points in their life. Do they actually kill them or they just die? Like how do those two things work? Yeah. Um, so you asked about, about the queen. Right? Yeah. How's, how is the queen, how is the next queen selected? So a, co a colony only ever needs one queen. Um, and the bees will always sense her presence. She releases a particular kind of pheromone that lets them know that she's in attendance. And that pheromone will be rubbed on, on the workers and it's passed through the colony. So they'll know, okay, the queen's there, everything's there. But if this pheromone... Um, ever disappears then they'll know that she's she's died or um or that maybe she's getting old and they should replace her and at that point um workers will begin raising a new queen so they'll build a particular kind of um cell in the comb it's much bigger it's it's kind of it's, it's very ugly looking it's sort of distended and strange kind of a globular waxy thing um mm. and and then they'll begin feeding a female egg with royal jelly or, or not an egg, a larvae. Um, so all, all honeybee larvae will be fed royal jelly for a few days um, when they first hatch. But this particular larvae would be fed royal jelly for much longer. And that would mean that it, it um, is raised into a new queen. Sometimes a, a few queens may be raised at, at the same time. Um, and that's a... Uh, I guess that's a sort of evolutionary survival of the fittest type tactic. So a couple of queens might hatch and then they would fight to the death and the strongest one would become the new queen. Hmm. Yeah. And you also asked about drones. Yeah. So yeah, so when they, they're starved by the workers. Um, so the workers will, I think, push them towards the area of the comb where there's... Um, the honey has been capped with wax and they can't break open the wax. So I think that means that they starve um, and then they're kicked out of the hive. So towards winter at the moment, um, beekeepers are finding that their, their hives have piles of drones outside the entrance because all the drones in the colony are being, um, uh, I guess, just cast off in preparation for winter. There's only so much food um, to be had through the winter, so they just need to get drones aren't important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Waste of space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. It, 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 it literally is like 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 you said the 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 size of the colony is massive in the summer, and then it goes down to like like a really small number, isn't it? Like I don't know what's it like. I don't know, like a few hundred or something like that, or is it more than that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it goes right down to because. I, w I wouldn't open a hive in winter um, because they're, it's so important to them to retain their body heat. Um, mm. But if you open a hive in winter, you're letting lots of cold in, so I just wouldn't touch it. Um, but I guess a, f a few thousand? Yeah, mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Just talking about the, the, the drones before we move on from that, and I'd, I'd heard you speak about the way they sort of uh, mate with the with the queen is quite interesting it's like they i'd never i'd never thought about it but i also was quite fascinated to hear how that all works maybe you could just give us an like a quick explanation of how they procreate <laughs> yeah so um a virgin queen will um at the beginning of the summer want to um want to mate and she will only mate over the um she'll only mate maybe a few times over over a short period and um, and her aim is to fill herself up with enough sperm to um, lay eggs throughout her the rest of her life and so she'll she'll lay thousands of eggs a day um, and the way that she makes is on warm balmy <laughs> summer <laughs> afternoons all of the drones in an area 
will fly up and they'll meet in what's known as the drone congregation zone, which is like a cloud of male bees all flying in, in the sky. Um, there's one of these, it's, I've heard about Crystal Palace in London, uh -huh. although I've never seen it. Um, and on one of these afternoons, all the virgin queens of an area will also go up and they'll find this, um, this drone congregation zone. And, and at the point that they reach it, they'll begin releasing a particular pheromone that will alert the drones to the fact that they've arrived. And the drones will then seek out the queen and um, mate with her. And she'll mate with a number of males over, over a... Um, over a um, sorry, so I met with a number of drones through this afternoon, again and again. Um, huh. And each time she makes with the drone, his uh, penis and part of his insides are ripped out, so he'll die. Huh. Um, and oh, wow. she'll keep mating and keep mating and keep mating and then go back to the hive and possibly go out again. But yeah, she'll <laughs> still have that in the form to, wow. to lay for the rest of her life. It's insane. <laughs> so, so just quickly, is that, is that drone um, mating area, is that like a, a specific area that stays the same or by the sounds of it? Or does it, yeah, is it just I weird? Think so. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's really so. interesting. That's the way, yeah, that was the way it's been described to me. Yeah. Wow. So, so when you see like a swarm of bees, is that what you're talking about or it's, that's actually something different? No. So, so a swarm of bees, um, honeybees swarm when, um, how to explain this, <laughs> um, honeybees, um, their aim in summer is to expand as quickly as possible in the hive. Um, so it's helpful to think of swarming as a soup in terms of the superorganism again. Um, it's like their reproductive function. They'll, they'll expand as fast as they can inside the hive. And then when they get too big for it, they'll split. The colony will split in two. Half of it will leave with the queen and the other half will stay and, and uh, raise a new queen. Hmm. And, and in that way, honeybees procreate. That's the, that's the reproductive function of the colony. Um, the oh. more colonies are created through, through this sort of splitting mechanism. Hmm. Crazy. And, and so just talking a little bit about the honey side of things, there's obviously a big issue now with fake honey. And mm. what, what does that actually involve? You know, do people putting in, what, well, what does it involve? Are they putting in random stuff? Are they putting in, I don't know, artificial sugars? How does that all work? Yeah, there was a big story in Australia a couple of months ago, wasn't there, about, I think it was corn suet that had been... Um, that had been put into honey. I think it's it's interesting because a lot of the um, news stories at that time were talking about pure honey and adulterated honey. Um, and in a way, um, I, I found that interesting because it, it draws attention to how we think of honey and the way that we, um, I guess the, 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 um, Place that we put it we still see it as this very pure very special product it's it's been so meaningful to us for so many thousands of years um but actually the honey that we have is um very often uh, already treated with or al already contaminated with all kinds of pesticides mm -hmm. honeybees now the nectar that they're collecting is so often um from areas where pesticides of all kinds are used. So I think um, a, a study came out last year that said 75% of honey worldwide now contains at least one neonicotinoid, which is this bee harming pesticide that's been in the news wow. a lot. Um, a study was done um, last year or the year before in America that found that um, of 19 samples tested, every single one contains glyphosate, which is another big pesticide that's been in the news recently mm. and in the UK honey was um, honey from China was banned for a couple of years because it contained such high levels of um, antibiotics which were being treated on bees and in, in the hives but that were making it 
through into the honey. Wow. So it's honey is a honey is no longer a, a pure and natural substance. It's something that is is of us and that contains the things that we're putting into our environment. Wow. It's That's it's crazy. almost impossible to to like have an organic type of honey then I guess because you don't know often I guess where your bees are maybe going to forage and stuff mm. so so yeah that's I that's interesting. It's really difficult I think yeah. for beekeepers who are wanting to yeah who who are wanting to follow organic principles I think it's it must be next to impossible. Bees fly a long distance from the hives. Um, normally, sort of two or three miles, but sometimes a, a lot more if they need if they need to travel for forage, and it's so oh. so difficult to, um, yeah, to to judge. And and, and what are, what are your thoughts like on the price of honey, right? Because I'm my my friend Andrew, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he uh, he also has his own uh, bees, and he like at the end of each um, season, he I think this season he produced like sixty jars of like honey, yeah. and like just the you know, and and he's like yeah, a lot of the people uh, that sell it will sell this for like four pounds, but he's like it's it's worth way much more than that, yeah. you know. If you think about all the time, efforts, and everything that goes into it, you know. And the fact that one bee produces one teaspoon and you're getting a jar like this, like it's just so undervalued. What are your thoughts yeah. on the price of honey? Yeah, I, I've spoken to a lot of beekeepers that have, have that, um, yeah, that have that same feeling. I think it's tricky because beekeepers need to make a living, but then when, when it becomes very expensive, then obviously it's, it's only a product for people that can afford it. I think it's... Um, yeah, I think it's really important to think about how we treat it, and that um, and that we really value it. Um, what we said earlier about a single bee um, makes it only a teaspoon of honey in her whole life, and like that really um, that really changes how I think about honey and how yeah. I think about using it. Um, and certainly, um, I would choose to buy from smaller scale honey producers than than bigger commercial beekeepers whose, whose practices they um would be more wary of yeah mm. that's a good point and what you mentioned pesticides and how is that affecting the health of the honeybees around the world mm, yeah good question um it's a really contentious issue but um Oh, I mean, so many chemicals are being ploughed into a into a um, land at the moment that it's having all kinds of effects. So neonicotinoids, for example, um, affect bees, honeybees' homing and forage, foraging ability, the way they learn, communication, um, all kinds of effects that are very. Um, very fi um, fine-tuned, difficult to, like, very difficult to discriminate. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, crazy to me when you think about it. What what we're doing to these crucial crucial um, creatures. And, and is so important. And just like following on from that there's talk or like people say that if bees die, like humans also die. Is there some truth to that? Um, oh, I, I don't, I don't know. And I'm not, I guess I'm not an, I'm not an expert on it, but um, I, I say, I guess I'm definitely not an expert. On it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, there's a really interesting, um, image that someone's done if you google um supermarket aisle without honeybees um or supermarket aisle without bees then you can see what a grocery aisle of a supermarket would look like if we didn't have pollinators um, and it is it's amazing um, i think they're pretty much just oranges <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so bees and other all kinds of pollinators are responsible for i think people say a third of the food that we eat um, so our diet and our lifestyles would drastically change, I think, if 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 we didn't have pollinators around. Mm. 
<laughs> That's really scary. And and what about um what about like other products? So bees are not just I guess making honey, or or maybe they are just making honey, and we've got byproducts of that. But you have like bee pollen and bees wax, and you know. I, so I I went to a bee farm when I was in South Africa a couple of years ago, and they were selling like all these creams and everything that that yeah. you can. And they, this guy was like. He was so passionate about bees. He, and he like, he, when you heard him talk, he was like, you wanted to be a, a beekeeper. But yeah, <laughs> he, seriously. But he was selling all the, all these like um, creams and, and everything else, and just said there, there's so many positive um, uh, impact it can have on you by applying it, and and had, had so many other things it can help with. You know, what are the, um, what are these products, and what can they help you with? Yeah, I mean, they're so, they're such amazing um, producers. So they make honey and they make beeswax and humans have in this like, very ancient relationship with bees developed all kinds of um, medicines and treatments and, and uh, products out of these uh, um, things that we've collected from bees. Um, I really love beeswax candles and I'd really, mm. I'd really like learn to make those and that's and yeah I guess that's a really nice thing to make because you can use old wax you don't need to be um taking things out of a of a of a living hive um yeah and and like for example uh just following on from Gareth there um things like propolis uh, that's something that you hear a lot what what is that and what is the yeah that's a, a really it's almost like the glue that bees use it's it's a really sticky um tough substance made from um trees and sap they use it to um if there's a draft in the hive then they'll cover the hole with properly mm. they, they sort of use it as a um substance to to um fill in gaps where they need to yeah it's kind Probably of a <laughs> yeah 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 exactly like yeah, yeah. and and manuka honey this is something that in I, I presume it's worldwide but in australia you just hear it all the time everyone's like yeah. if you basically want to cure anything you should be eating manuka honey what is the proposed benefit and, and what's different about it i'm not sure i'm not sure but the, yeah i don't know sorry okay i um, know oh, it's just going on sorry. crazy yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know it's it's um, massive over here as well, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the uh, yeah, and and manuka costs like yeah, like yeah. how much honey probably should actually cost. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, exactly. Like, really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and probably and just then, pure pure honey, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then the, this is always like an interesting one. You hear about um, people that are vegan that they'll like not have honey because it's a plant product but actually what is it because is it a plant product isn't it an, an animal product because in effect i think the bees are literally just transporters of this mm. like what are your what are your thoughts around that and whether it's plant or animal yeah product. yeah exactly yeah um i guess this is just another this is just another way that bees slip our categories but mm. it's it, both and neither. <laughs> mm. I think it really is difficult to say and our, our categories are ins insufficient for their strange ways. Yeah. What do you, Gareth, I mean, what have you read? Like, are vegans, do vegans eat honey or? Mm -mm. No, like the no. people that are like, I guess, hardcore vegans, mm. they, they will avoid honey because yeah. it's an animal product. I guess maybe because an animal has been involved in it and also because we've used them yeah 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 we've we're kind of like taking them out of their natural habitats and we it's it's like cruelty in a way too do that's a question do do you think that beekeeping is cruel like are we taking them out of their natural habitats and and forcing them to do something that you know in for, for our benefit only mm. yeah i think there's many different um, modes of beekeeping um, there's a huge spectrum from people who describe themselves as natural beekeepers to huge industrial scale beekeepers who have thousands of hives across an area um, and I yeah I don't think I can answer that question because it's so it's so huge 
um, and people's um, techniques and methods are so different. Um, I think for me that there's there's um, no harm being done to the bees when they're um, when we're we're providing them with a safe and a healthy container and environment to live in. Um, that that's how I think of my role as a beekeeper too. I'm not a beekeeper so much as a hive keeper and I can look after their space and I can provide them with a space to live in and I can make sure that that's a good space and it's a hardy space and, and um, they can leave when, I mean, they can leave when they want. It's not like a cage. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the no, weird, no, that's no. the crazy thing about beekeeping is that you, you can't shut the door. They, if they don't like your hive, then, then they'll leave. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's the same thing you were mentioning about being, how do you categorize them? And this is the really interesting thing as a whole, this conversation is just like, they're such interesting creatures because you just can't put a label on them and you know, you've got them there, but they can go. So that, you know, and, but I mean, if I'm just thinking about that now, if you've got uh, chickens and stuff at your house and you feed them and look, I mean, I don't know, is that, you know, it's just, in my mind, a similar kind of thing. I mean, if they wanted to get away, they could, if you're on a farm or something and you cr provide safety and space for them. I mean, uh, you're not f like necessarily forcing them to be there, but in, in a way you are like, so it is a really, <laughs> it's a, it's a really interesting question though. So um, I don't think it's an easy one to sort of categorize, is it? I think mm. if your intention, what is your intention behind having them? That mm. might be able to help answer the question a bit, you know? Mm. And I think, and I guess the harm that we do is is not to provide the foraging habitats that they need to um, be healthy. Um, that to, st to start up a hive in an area where um, either there's not enough forage or the forage is harmful to them, I guess that that feels like a yeah that feels very uncomfortable to me. Mm. Yeah. yeah, to me, to me, like. I think it's a, I, I don't, I have zero issue with it, like whatsoever. I think it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, you know, you provide them a place to stay and uh, they provide you with honey and other things. And I've never met a beekeeper who does not absolutely love their bees. You know what I mean? There's so much love in, in the way that they, they think about them, they care about them. Really? interesting isn't it yeah. there's no yeah. cruelty there whatsoever there you know what i mean not in anyone i've ever spoken to yeah yeah and helen talking about you know it's a bit doing them a disservice by not having the uh you know having foraging space maybe you could give us a few of your top tips for people that are listening that maybe are actually thinking about getting a hive for their garden maybe you can give them some tips on where to begin and some of your best advice for starting? Mm. Um, oh, yeah, good question. I think, um, have a think about the kind of hive that you would like to start with. Um, I really enjoyed having a top bar hive because I wasn't so worried about honey, um, about harvesting lots of honey, but I was really interested in um, learning about these, um, the, I guess, the, the sort of interior processes and the life inside the hive. Um, I think linking up, we've said already, but linking up with a local group is really important. Um, and reading, I think, to read books about bees rather than about beekeeping is a really nice way to start, to get interested in the creature rather than in your role. Um, I th yeah that's nice and, th and then you kind of know what you're know who you're meeting <laughs> for sure and, and sorry just talking about books i know we kind of briefly touched on it but can do you just maybe explain like what what people will get from reading the book that you wrote mm. um i i guess it pulls in it, it's partly a really personal story about um becoming a beekeeper for the first time and what that meant for me um, in a 
pretty busy and strained and stressed life. Um, and it also pulls in bits of beekeeping history and science and physiology. Um, the whole experience over the course of that year um, led me into lots of uh, encounters and um, experiences that I wasn't expecting. So I ended up in the archives at the Natural History Museum and on a rooftop looking inside a hive and meeting a um, really lovely eccentric group of um, natural beekeepers in someone's living room in Oxford. Um, so the book kind of details all of that and I guess it's it's quite a thoughtful contemplative book. It's about my my interior life as much as the bees interior life. So, yeah. Cool. yeah. Beautiful. So uh, what are what are your future plans? You're now settled. Uh, you're not moving around as much. You've got your bees. You've got a wonderful uh, musician that you live with there. And <laughs> what is uh, what is the plan going forward? And um, what is your hives plan for the winter? I guess going into winter. Yeah. Um... Well, at this time of year, yeah, all the bees are, are preparing for winter and it feels a bit like we are too. It's getting much colder this week. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm writing a lot and teaching writing and I'm thinking about the next book. Um, yeah, and I think home, I'm not sure that I've found settled this totally. I've not totally found a... Um, the stability that we talked about but I think I've come to think of stability in in a different way and maybe um yeah like we mentioned before it's maybe home is more of a um a feeling that you have in you than a particular place yeah sure that's cool mm. Thanks for your sense. and um <laughs> if people want to find out a bit about you or follow you or get your book what where can they do that Oh yeah, thank you. So I'm on Twitter. Um, it's Helen with two underscores Dukes. Um, and the book is called Honeybee Heart Has Five Openings. And it is available from all of the normal places. Mm, that's awesome. I, had a, I had a good laugh uh, when I was just doing some research. Um, one of the first things that came up was um, something about Het Honing Bay, which is it was the Dutch version of your book, and I, yeah. I thought, oh, that's so cool. And it's, there's a German, and so it's been translated into a number of languages. It's always nice yeah. to see. I've been, um, it, was, it was out in Germany last week, and I've spent the last seven days trying to say the title in German, and it's still struggling. <laughs> it's, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing long title. <laughs> what does it sound like in German? I'm going to, I can, <laughs> let me hold it up for you. <laughs> This is it, but I'm not sure I can pronounce it. <laughs> oh, it looks, it looks really Close. nice. <laughs> yeah, have a go. <laughs> cool. Um, Helen, I just wanted to say a massive thank you uh, for for coming on our podcast. Like, uh, you know, Craig and I have both been fascinated by bees and by nature. Uh, for a long time, especially like growing up in South Africa, we feel like it's just been such mm. a big part of our lives and impacted us too in terms of how we uh, see the world and how we relate to people. Um, and this chat has just been outstanding. Like you yeah. have just answered so many uh, questions that we have about bees and, and you've actually, you know, made me even more keen to go and start my own hive now and yeah, uh, amazing. I, yeah and, oh. and and find out more you know because i reckon what like you said once you read the books um and you get even more into the detail you become more fascinated and you can pull like parallels to maybe how you how you treat your own life and the people in your life and, and the things that you do you know and i think that's super important we have so much to learn from nature and mm. if we can, if we can do, all do that, then the world will definitely be a better place. So, uh, mm. thanks so much for this chat, and it was oh, uh, really, you. really awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah. just briefly from my side, Helen, uh, 
couldn't agree more with what Gareth said. The parallels are what are just so interesting about your story and, and just in general, when you actually knuckle down and focus in on something, it's those little meanders and the offshoots of these places you find yourself at um, mm-hmm. during a journey into um, learning about something in depth uh, is what's so exciting. And, and I think when you're dealing with a dynamic and interesting creature that's alive, not just a subject, uh, obviously even more exciting and interesting. And there is, it is in the zeitgeist at the moment, um, mm-hmm. as it should be, because I think they're, they are in trouble and it, it helps us reflect on what are we doing to nature as human beings. And uh, I think it's, uh, they're these, these beautiful creatures, but they've got the sting at the end of the day. And it's, it's this reminder that, you know, nature will always come back. It always has a way. And, uh, but still to treat them, uh, other creatures and beings with the utmost respect, because when you look at them, they're so complex in the, and so with so much intent behind them. And they're not just there, the thing that might come and sting you they Mm-hmm. There's a whole life behind, and I love that aspect. So, so thanks for uh, opening us up to that world. And uh, uh, I think uh, people must definitely get out there and read your book and uh, connect more with nature. So, thanks again. Thank you so much. Really, real pleasure. Mm. Cool, cool. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. So, so, how did you How did you find that? Oh, you guys are great. Thank you so much. Sorry, oh, I, I fluffed somewhat. Some no. Oh, not no. at all. No way. Uh, people be mesmerized by what you had to say. Did well. you guys grow up, to each, grow up with each other and then move to different places? No, we actually, um, we, we met in um, Ibiza actually in 2013, <laughs> just through like a common friend. And like, you know, I guess you kind of find your tribe pretty quickly and we just hit it off since then. And then Craig was actually living in Holland at the time. Wow. And I'm, I'm, I've always been in London and then he, um, yeah, he moved out to Aussie about two years ago now. So this podcast is kind of a way for you guys to keep in touch as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, it's, it's, it's turned that, into that. In a it's way, turned yeah. into that. Yeah. That was, I mean, That's we were, so okay. yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool actually. But also so. that parallel that it's so meaningful to what we've gone through because by us like learning how to run a podcast and, all the little things that you've got to do, it's like taught me, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak for both of us, but it's taught me so much, you know, like about little other things or how to send decent emails or whatever it is. You always learn other yeah. little things when you're yeah, trying to learn yeah. one thing. And, I, and I, I just, that's why you want to, I want to learn more these days. It's like such a yeah. great um, thing. So, oh. yeah, so we've, we've been doing the podcast now. You've just over one year now, well, you'll be like our, which episode, like 50, what would it be, Gareth? 50 55, I think. Yeah. Five or so. Yeah. So what? just over a, a year, once a week. And um, yeah, we just, uh, we love in the journey. We, we, um, it's been a really good journey for us. And, and we have grown as friends as well, obviously. Mm. Um, yeah, we spend a lot of time. Yeah, no, it's really cool. We're loving it. And we get to speak to people like yourself. And, yeah. you know, one day you might come to us and, you, you know, we might hang out or, you know, like that's, you, you yeah, create friendships along the way as well which is cool yeah yeah oh, each, thanks so much. each episode like alters our kind of you know thoughts or changes our thoughts on the world or it just gives us yeah. a new perspective in some sort of way because every person has such an amazing story and uh, something to learn from it doesn't matter who you are in this world yeah. like people must always remember that we've all gone through a different path you know and we we can each learn from each other and that's the that's half the reason we we started the podcast because we kind of realized that the importance of telling stories yeah amazing that's so nice oh it's really inspiring (laughs) yeah cool Cool. all right lovely to meet you cool yeah thank you you so much for today i appreciate it cool yeah likewise thanks so much thank you see you later have a good day see you later bye -bye. cheers bye-bye thanks bye Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, 